welcome again to another episode of Smash TV, where 10 more movies await my verdict. The verdict is an extremely tense and well-made court drama featuring Paul Newman, a lazy, failed lawyer down on his luck who spends most of his time hassling the relatives of deceased people in order to get cases. With the help of a friend he gets a medical malpractice case thrown on his lap and quickly finds himself sympathizing and fighting for the victim while fighting off the Goliath company representing the hospital who will do anything to have the case ended in their favor. The verdict is a slow, meticulous movie. One of those movies they simply do not make anymore. Don't misunderstand me, it's slow and feels long but is far from boring. Paul Newman's performance is amazing and his interactions with his co-stars such as Rampling are a pleasure. The cinematography is great and you'll be pleased to see how the movie progresses. Court dramas are a dime in a dozen but this movie is most definitely a gem. Smash that. Hawk the Slayer. Fantasy movies are usually a hit or a miss, world building, style and visuals are crucial ingredients that need to be weighed so meticulously it can very quickly become a recipe for disaster. Hawk the Slayer unfortunately is a movie that lacks plausible fantasy world, has little to no style and mediocre visuals. We follow Hawk, a young man in search of a group of warriors who will aid him to reclaim a magical sword held by his evil older brother, the murderer of his father. Throw in the love of a woman and we got ourselves a powder keg of drama and adventure. One that fizzles out and offers no bang at all. There's plenty of 80s cheese to be found in this movie but doesn't give me enough to recommend it. The action is mediocre, the heroes are fairly lame, the villains are over the top and for some reason everyone talks like a teen attempting to write a medieval movie. There is only so much shall a man can bear. Verily. Drop that. The Color Out of Space is one of three movies I know of depicting the Lovecraftian story to the screen. I already saw the excellent 2019 Nicolas Cage version of the story and have yet to see the Spanish movie made in 2014 with the same name. This version of the movie however is filmed completely in black and white and is set partially in 1975 where a young man goes to search for his missing father and stumbles on the weird story of the color that came out of space. The movie follows the outline of the book pretty well and it runs parallel with what happens in the Cage version without being overly repetitive. The gist of it, a meteor falls to Earth and brings along changes in the proximity of the blast. At first these changes are hailed as miracles but things quickly, and violently, go awry. Color Out of Space is a great story and the movie is very entertaining for a low-budget movie but out of the three movies I currently have a fondness for the neon horror of the 2019 version which is a must to combine with the their neon surrealism movie Cage stars in called Mandy. My recommendation, watch this version during the day to get a feel of it. And then, later in the evening, after dinner and a few shots, watch both Cage's Mandy and Color Out of Space back to back. You will not regret it. Smash that. Electric Dragon 80,000K. An aggressive kid who received electroshock treatment for his violence learned to channel electricity over the years. Now, as an adult, he works as a private investigator and then he meets a strange cable repairman turned vigilante with similar powers. And, well, stuff happens. Electric Dragon is a typical weird Japanese movie with extravagant people and a semi-humorous but totally insane plot. Unfortunately it misses the spark, haha, look at how I made that pun, that is needed to make the movie memorable. It was a box office failure and, together with the film Gojo, led to the bankruptcy of the production company. I cannot recommend this movie, if you want to see something in the same vein with more comedy be sure to check out the first Hentai Kamen or, if you want something more Linkian, the Tetsuo Trilogy. Beware the latter one though, it's not for the faint of heart. Drop that. Heavy Metal 2000. Is the Anno 2000 sequel to the cult classic rotoscope animation Heavy Metal from 1981? Where the first movie was dirty, gritty, sexy and pretty damn cool, this one tries to achieve that greatness but doesn't get very far with it. The attempt is there but it's not enough, the art style is too clean, the plot isn't surreal enough and even the world that is set in this universe feels wrong. 
There's little to no nudity or sexual content unlike the first movie and it overall just lacks sexiness and style. It feels made by numbers, soulless, a cash-in. A mediocre sequel made in a different age. A more safe age, constrained and cold. If you've already seen the original I would suggest you watch the Metal Erlon Chronicles, a series based on the comics anthology Metal Erlon which in turn was the inspiration for Heavy Metal magazine and consequent movies. Drop that. Monster Hunter. Hollywood has a track record of ruining franchises that have been beloved for decades and years by millions of fans expecting an easy cash-in buy. For whatever reason, making something that has absolutely nothing to do with the source material. Monster Hunter is one of these movies, and plus it's a paint-by-numbers checklist movie that is devoid of soul. The moments the movie tries to be exciting are a bore, the times they try to be funny fail, the emotional areas are as void as a sociopath's attempts at emotion. We get exactly three types of monsters and I'm quite sure, despite not having played the game, they're not like anything the game has to offer. Movies like this make you wonder why they make movies like these, why not make a story around the actual game rather than having corporations and other nitwits decide what might sell or not. Making movies, like everything else in life, requires finesse and skill. You can spray a million bullets around and I'm sure you'll hit something at one point but a true hunter is methodical and focused. Leave Monster Hunter alone, it's not worth your time nor should we give our hard-earned dollars to companies for crap like this just so they can give us a sequel or ruin something else cause they think they had it right. Drop that. Back to school. An uneducated, crass, self-made millionaire enrolls in his son's college in order to convince him that degrees do matter and uses his money to get ahead. Though along the road he learns something about himself in the process teaches his son a worthwhile lesson. Back to School is a classic 80s comedy movie with the legendary Rodney Dangerfield spewing his New York accent and suave in a series of comedic scenes. We see a young Robert Downey Jr. though he isn't a primary character in the movie. Back to School is a classic movie you must have seen, the comedy is between a chuckle and a laugh and it's a movie like they don't make them anymore. In the grand scheme of things Back to School isn't the best college comedy movie of the 80s but it's most definitely among the top 8. Check that. Ninja 2009 The mystical Japanese warrior slash assassin called ninjas has always been a fascinating subject to delve into. Many movies from the 70s and 80s featured these mystical warriors and attributed skill and almost magical powers to them. The 2009 movie Ninja steps into the footsteps of the American Ninja series and attempts to recreate that series cult standing for a modern post-2000 era. And as with most things in this era everything feels overly safe and tame. It doesn't pack the punch you would expect, it doesn't have the magic you would think. Ninja isn't the worst movie but there are so many movies that do this genre better you're better off watching one of those. If you do make a movie make it so you aspire to be up there, don't just go through the motions. You'll end up with margarine instead of butter. Margarine is fine. It's just not as good. Drop that. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. For those who don't know, the immensely popular series Buffy the Vampire Slayer was a serial reboot of the 1992 movie by the same name. This movie featuring Christy Swanson as Buffy is a cookie comedy about a dumb blonde cheerleader who just happens to be the chosen one in an ancient battle against vampires. I have never seen the series and if the series is anything like the movie it is most definitely not for me. As previously stated it's an extremely silly, almost farcical view on vampires and horror which might be the point but, the humor in the movie didn't amuse me and made the silly events depicted in it rather annoying. The acting is subpar seeing they're all trying their best to be silly. Including the late Rutger Hauer and teenage heartthrob Luke Perry. To me there wasn't enough to this movie to keep me interested nor gave me the courage to go through multiple seasons of it. Drop that. Delirium, photo of joy air. We have Italian spaghetti westerns but apparently we also have spaghetti horror and this apparently is one of them. 
Delirium, photo of Joy as an attractive and busty owner of a men's magazine deal with an obsessive stalker who starts killing off her equally attractive models and sending her their body parts. Who is behind this awful deed and has that creepy wheelchair guy next door something to do with it? To be concise, this movie offers some interesting takes on horror but unfortunately doesn't get too far with it. It would have been much more interesting to see more of the killer's almost daily visions combined with naked women galloping around in their typical Italian way. The sex scenes mostly dealing with men and women weirdly rubbing themselves against each other in a manner that becomes almost comical could have been replaced by a wee bit more gratuitous shots of busty dames and hunks. But alas, while this offers a little bit of entertainment it is unfortunately a movie that will disappear from your memory the moment you turn it off. Check that. Well, that was that. Go away now.